what I said was this idea of eternal life and entering the kingdom, and then we've left everything and followed you, what you're going to get in this time and age to come, eternal life. So one of the things you seem to get from Mark, I'm trying to put together his his view of salvation in the future and what's supposed to happen. And I like to stay with our method that we've tried to establish of let Mark be Mark. And others, to some degree, let's kind of, even though I've mentioned some Q parallels here earlier when we began this and we got interrupted, uh, it's good to think, well, if I only had Mark, how would I put it together? What's the kingdom? What's salvation? What's the mystery? Take it as a kind of composite work that Mark is now presenting uh, in his own way and assuming there's some consistency. And I think there is. But many of the first will be last and the last first. So that particular passage seems to be very important. And my understanding of the hundredfold in this life is that he still thinks that there's going to be a period of time in which he's going to carry on the message. And remember, for Mark, it goes to all nations when you talk about what, what the mission is. In Mark 13, which is our apocalyptic chapter, before the sign of the end finally comes, and they are expecting the sign of the end, and it has to do with this desolating sacrilege set up in the temple. And I'm going to get to some of that later because I'm going to talk about 70 AD, post or after, and so forth. But Mark does have that very intriguing passage. In fact, let's just go look at that real quick. Mark 13. And you go on and you're talking about what's going to happen, false Christs and so forth. And you get, uh, let's see, right here. Uh, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and kingdoms and earthquakes and all that. And that's just the beginning of a dissolution. But you yourself will be delivered up and you're going to have persecution and trials. And don't worry, God will be with you. But this verse right here. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. That seems to give you a little glimpse of Mark's perspective, almost like where he is living. And then this is beef, and then you have to endure to the end. See, so there's going to be this persecution. The gospel is being preached to all the nations. So Mark is clearly writing at a time when the idea of going to all the nations is very important. And one of you ask whether the mystery might be what we have in uh, Romans 16. Uh, let's see, I don't have my Bible I left downstairs, but uh, let's see, I should have a Bible somewhere here. Of course I do. Uh, let me just read you the passage in Romans 16. You know, just kind of thinking, is is Mark's view of the future kind of the same as Paul's? Because Paul thinks you're going to have eternal life. He thinks you have to keep the commandments and so forth. So this is this doxology of Romans that people have wondered about. It's verse 25 and 26. Now, to him who is able to firm, keep you firmly in accord with my good tidings, my gospel, and my proclamation of Jesus, the anointed, the Christ. By the way, I'm reading uh, uh, Bentley Hart's translation, which is one of the best of the New Testament, in my opinion. He's a teacher at Notre Dame. So according to the proclamation of Jesus, the anointed, the Christ, according to a revelation of the mystery held in silence through time's ages, but now made manifest through the prophetic scriptures, and made known to all the nations for the purpose of the submission of faith. So that's a very Pauline idea that Mark possibly shares that the good news of the kingdom proclaimed by Jesus, which Jesus never really did, has to first go to all the nations before you would have the end come. And then you have he endures to the end. So you get this idea that the end is not yet. 
In other words, you're going to have all of these other things, but the end is not yet. Um, so he seems to have this idea of now in this time, but in the age to come eternal life. And at least in Mark, it seems to me that when he finally describes the end, right after the, that this is it. For in those days, there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation, which God created until now and never will be. And if those days had not be shortened, had not were not shortened, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then you have, after the tribulation, the heavenly signs, and then the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, sending out the angels to gather the elect from the four winds from the ends of the earth. Now, I don't want to get into preterism today, but I know people who are full preterists would say, well, that already happened, and the church is gathering people and so forth. It's all fulfilled in the church, and the Jews were kicked out of God's favor and so forth. But as you keep reading, uh, you get the fig tree, and then when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. It could be it is near, but since it, the last thing you mentioned was the Son of Man coming in the clouds, 14, Mark 14, if you go down to 62 right here, this is uh, the high priest. But he was, uh, he's being questioned by the high priest. This is Caiaphas. He Mark doesn't say it's Caiaphas, I don't think, no. But he was silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And as you saw in the course, this is where Jesus finally reveals himself. He says, I am, and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Now, my own understanding is that that would be parallel to Mark 13. And I here would go to Paul, 1 Thessalonians 4, that the anointed appears, Christ, the Son of God, with a shout and with a trumpet, the same kind of idea. And the dead in Christ are raised and they meet him in the air. And that would be the angels gathering the elect from the four corners of the world and so forth. So I guess what I'm saying is we're kind of in the middle period here, it seems like, when Mark is writing. Is he after 70 or before 70? Hold that for a minute. But in terms of what the scheme is. So I want to have eternal life. That's the ultimate. The alternative is to be cast into Gehenna, right? Remember? Uh, those who are cast out of the kingdom are cast into Gehenna. Uh, for example, Jesus and Mark, he's, he's, he's kind of nice. And yes, I heard one of you say God is love. But there's, a, there's the judgment in Mark, and it, it's pretty harsh. If you look up him, his talk about Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom. It's a metaphor for the trash dump outside Jerusalem, the dung gate. Some of you have been there, in which you get thrown into the trash pit, basically. And the point is, you can't be in the city. You can't be in the banquet. You don't get you don't get to be part of the messianic banquet. And in Mark, remember when he's asked a question that he won't answer, and then he's by what authority do you do this? And he said, Well, let me ask you a question. What question did he ask? Was John the Baptist from heaven or from men? There's what was his real authority? And they won't answer because so they would be seen as unrepentant and um, basically unable to respond or they didn't choose to respond. And uh, he kind of just dismisses them. Another time he walks away and says, there'll be no sign given to this generation. So it seems to me that uh, what you're getting there is this idea of the son of man coming in glory with angels with some kind of judgment. Now there's another passage I put down. Let's try eight, um, 34. I'll just do eight because I don't know if it's going to get the exact verse. And we go on down to 34.
he calls this is that this is that first uh trifold pattern of suffering misunderstanding and teaching about discipleship that we covered in the course but then you get this what does it profit a man this is again like q isn't it this is very much like q don't fear those who can kill the body but can't kill the soul fear the one who can destroy soul and body in gehenna so for what can a man give in return for his life for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So that's the one of the places where you seem to get this judgment coming based upon Daniel 7, in which the Son of Man appears in the clouds of heaven and the kingdoms of the world are destroyed. Remember in Daniel's image, they bro are broken in pieces and basically trampled and they don't even exist anymore. And then the saints of the Most High take the kingdom. That's Daniel 7. But this this all of this language about the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, and I think even Paul, uh, is based upon uh, this idea of Daniel 7. And he's claiming to be that one but as I've said before, if you read Daniel 7, it's a corporate thing. That's why he says, if you he calls the multitude with his disciples, if any man would come after me, I'm going to go die on the cross. We talked about this last time. But if you would like to also be part of this kingdom of God, you got to follow me. So there's our Mark suffering that we've talked about so much. So when you think about his view of salvation or of heaven, he does sometimes use the term heaven, like you'll have treasure in heaven. It seems to me that he's envisioning things as breaking up the cosmos being dissolved and entering into this new stage. As it doesn't sound like he has this political view of the kingdom where Jesus is going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem and rule and reign, you know, like a millennium idea, and all of them will be with him. And I think that's coming from Paul, because remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 when he's talking about judging. He says, don't you know the saints will judge the world, we will judge angels. And the only glimpse we get in Paul, it's a lot like Mark. What happens beyond that coming of the Son of Man and the gathering of the elect to meet the Lord in the air? What happens beyond that? Well, Paul's, Paul handles it, handles it theologically. He says, well, Jesus will reign until he puts all enemies under his feet. And when all enemies are put under his feet, then he himself will subject himself to God so that God will be all in all, okay? Since I'm here in Mark 9, truly I say to you, some standing here will not taste of death before they see the kingdom of God come with power. This would support this. I think he's referring to what they're going to see right then. After six days, he takes Peter, James, and John up to a high mountain. He's transfigured before them transfigured is that he's appearing in this glorified state before it really comes it's proleptic and what are you going to see in the glorified state you're going to see people like moses and elijah who are the two other figures that he identifies with and have you noticed that the identification is you fast 40 days in the desert right one of you asked about the temptation you fast 40 days in the desert well, who fasted 40 days in the desert? Moses and Elijah. So you have these two prophetic figures, but they're glorified. His garments are glistening intensely white as no fuller on earth could bleach them. So he's giving them this vision of the kingdom of God. And he says to the high priest, you'll see the son of man coming in the clouds, seated at the right hand of power. You see the idea. Um, that also involves binding the strong man. 
One of you asked this. I'm putting a bunch of questions together quickly. So Mark 3, 27, I just want to get all this out and then we can talk about it a little bit for a while. Mark 3, 27. This is very interesting. He's casting out demons. Now, again, Q, isn't this interesting how, you know, I didn't emphasize this in the course because I wanted you to just read Mark. But this idea, if I, by the finger of God, cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That's one of the main verses in Mark. I mean, in, in Q, right? Well, look at the parallel here about the divided kingdom. If a house is divided against itself, it will not stand. A lot of people think Abraham Lincoln said that, but he did. But he's quoting Jesus. And if Satan has risen up against himself and divided, he can't stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then he may plunder his house. So Jesus, in his, we call it ministry sometimes, his work of preaching and teaching the kingdom and healing and casting out demons, is beginning to lay siege on the house of Satan, the power of Satan, by casting it out. And remember, the demons are subject to him. I know who you are. Have you come to punish us before the time? So this is some of that eschatology that we can begin to put together. If, if we just used Mark and went through and marked all of these passages, and I tried to pick some of the main ones, but there are others. So the kingdom of God coming with power, the gathering of the elect, the, the gospel first being preached to all the nations. Mark's in that world. We call it the middle of time. He's in the interim in which you're being persecuted and the message is going to all nations. And then the Son of Man's going to appear immediately after the tribulation. And the tribulation is practically a quotation from Daniel chapter 12, where it says at the time of the end, there'll be this great tribulation. And it's literally a paraphrase, unprecedented, like no other in history and will never be again. That's Daniel 12. If you've never looked it up, many of you know these passages. Mark is quoting that. And then he says, but the saints will rise and shine like the stars for he of heaven, right? Forever and ever. And the wicked will be cast into uh, Gehenna or punishment. He doesn't actually say the word Gehenna. But I think he might mention darkness or something like that. Now, you see where I'm going here. If you put all that together, you begin to get a kind of eschatology of where he is and what he views, uh, how he views salvation. As far as the means of salvation, you do have confessing Christ. We just read it. If you don't deny him or confess him, if you reject the baptism of John, in other words, if you reject this movement, that is finally preaching the final message of the kingdom of God is near at hand and it's coming soon. And what's that going to involve is no temple, I think even no city. You know, there's, it's not Jerusalem, it's not the temple. The Son of Man is seated at the right hand of power, and Moses and Elijah are part of it. So I think, like Paul, uh, Mark is is reflecting, and maybe from Paul a kind of uh, otherworldly age to come view of the future in which when the Son of Man appears in the clouds of heaven, this age passes away and a new age comes that we would usually call a heavenly age. Heaven being a location, but really, if you understand it, not so much a location as a new history of the world, this age and the age to come. And the other indication of that is when he talks about resurrection. Yeah, here it is. Now, look at this. They're asking resurrection, and he does teach resurrection. Um, when they rise from the dead, this, think of Daniel again. Daniel 12, first three verses. When they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. That's all Mark says. Luke expands it. He says, those who are worthy to attain eternal life in that age. So I think the age to come is like Paul. Paul says, Jerusalem above is the mother of us all, not Jerusalem below. 
So I don't think uh, the Pauline Markin group is really looking for a kingdom on the earth, that political social entity that we find in many, many texts. And even when you get it retold in Matthew, like Matthew 25, when the son of man comes and sit on it, sits on his glorious throne, you get this idea, I'm going to Matthew now 25, you get this idea that the world as we know it is passing away. So how do you obtain that? You keep the commandments, right? Uh, I, I wrote down a sort of whole cluster of things. Uh, Satan is overthrown, the temple's removed, the gospel goes to the nations, followers repent, they forgive others, they follow the commandments, they don't defile themselves with those 19 characteristics, remember of Mark 7, what defiles a person, they're not particularly interested in what you eat or what you drink or how you keep the Sabbath, even though the Sabbath's made for people, love God, love your neighbor, be prepared to sacrifice everything suffering, but you gain a community, and in the end, you gain resurrection and eternal life. So the pivotal verses seem to be basically, hey, my puppy got out, and I gotta, she got out of the cage. Hold on, guys. Here we go again. Let's look at my Mark students. Let's look at my Mark students. Here you go. There you go. Look at that. You want to kiss? You want to kiss? Okay. <laughs> so she got out of her cage. I don't know how. There's a latch. You are smart, sweetie. You are so smart. Okay. I think she'll just lay down by me. Sorry, this means internet puppies. <laughs> but if you're happy, I'm happy. Um, so that puts it together in a way, I think, for you. Um, when he criticizes the temple, he said it's supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, which it never was. Well, now this gives, uh, you know, reaching out to the nations is important. Uh, let's see. Think of Paul saying uh, in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7, as far as the mystery, he says none of the Rulers of the world knew the mystery or they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. So this idea that suffering is going to lead to the ultimate triumph and glory over the whole cosmos is something that the angels didn't see. This is Paul. But I think there's also this idea of casting out Satan and uh, th it means the evil forces. Or the, it actually says the rulers of the world, not the angels. But I think it's these angelic powers. Paul calls Satan the god of this world. Paul also has the hardening of Israel until the full number of Gentiles come in. One of you mentioned that in Romans eleven twenty five. 25. So that too could be something that's parallel. Um, so here's the question that I'm kind of working on here. What is salvation? Meaning what, what is eternal life? What is the future? What is the resurrection of the dead? It doesn't seem to be earthly in the sense of this age. Let's, let's put it this way, where we don't get into dualistic categories. It doesn't seem to have to do with this age, but with the age to come. And as Luke retells Mark, he says, you'll be like angels and won't die anymore. So you're basically gods. You don't die anymore. You have eternal life it means you don't die anymore. So that's Mark's view. I think it's Paul's view. But finally, several of you ask, and I heard some of you talking about this, but does Mark say to, to have that, to be part of this, gaining all the community that you get from the Markan community, lands, houses, mother, father, brothers, sisters, and everything, does he say that you got to do it through the blood of Jesus? in that evangelical Christian sense, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I addressed this a little bit in the last meeting. If Mark 10.45 is the climax, that's where you get that. 
that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's another one of those crescendo verses, I think, right? Give his life as a ransom for many. Ransom is the translation, and I think in the RSV, uh, give his life as a ransom for many. And it does, it is an allusion to Isaiah 53. But remember what we were talking about in the last meeting? Isaiah 53 is corporate. It's about the little flock or the little group over against the mainstream body of Israel that was called. Who is blind but my servant Israel? That's part of Isaiah's servant message. But he also believes that there's this suffering group of suffering servants that are going to be given the kingdom. I think Mark has picked up on that. So um, the question really would be, are you sure that Paul has the message that evangelical Christians think? That if he does think the blood of Jesus atones or somehow pays, helps pay for your sin, does he believe that you also, by suffering... So I'm not completely convinced. There's several things about Paul that I'm starting to think. I don't think he thinks Jesus is God. He does think Satan is the God of the world. He does think that Jesus is at the right hand of God, and he's got all power and glory, and he's going to defeat Satan. But he also believes that that suffering of Jesus pouring out his blood through which people are forgiven is also something that everybody's called to do. So in Romans 8, when he talks about, and we will be glorified with him, he says, provided that we suffer with him, provided that. So again, I'm wondering if, you know, this has been Lutheranized, so to speak, or Augustinized and turned into this mystery religion um, so that people uh, today at least would interpret it as, well, you got to have the blood of Jesus, which I think Paul believed and I think Mark believed, but is that blood, a, is that something you sit back and say, okay, I did that, signed, sealed, and delivered, or is it to participate in this way that Jesus inaugurated? And that would involve then forgiving your enemies, and keeping the commandments, and not defiling your heart, but being pure, and so forth and so on. Thank you.